Good evening, everyone. In the last year and a half, the entire faculty and staff of the National Ballet School came together over a number of meetings to articulate and refine the school's mission and vision as we head into the future. And out of that exercise came a formal document that speaks of, and I quote, innovating new approaches and movement techniques that will enable the school's graduates to expand the boundaries of the art form while remaining mindful of its history. And it's that concept of innovation that is mindful of history that I want to work, use as a framework this evening because I think it sheds light not only on the showcasing of the students' training and accomplishments, but also sheds light on the works themselves. Uh, so the works in this uh, year's Spring Showcase are going to be excerpts from La Bayadere, a ballet created by uh, Marius Petipa to music by Minkus in 1877. And this ballet is considered a transitional ballet when Petipa moved from the Romantic style to the capital C classical style, which I will discuss later. The second work is Scotch Symphony by George Balanchine, created to a symphony by Mendelssohn by the same name, minus the first movement, which Balanchine considered to be undanceable. And this was created in 1952 uh, in response to a trip that he made to Scotland. The next work is Jardy Tancat by the Spanish choreographer Nacho Duato to songs based on Catalan folk songs uh, composed and sung by Maria del Mar Bonet and this was created in 1983. This was Duato's very first choreography and is still considered to be one of his best. And finally, Ein von Fehl by Sabrina Matthews, a graduate of this school, uh, that she created in 2001 to excerpts from J.S. Bach's Goldberg Variations. Now, I've listed these works in chronological order. Uh, this is probably not the order that they will appear in the program, but I want to trace how the art form has evolved, and that only works if I treat them chronologically. But since I'm also interested in showing the relationship between tradition and progress, we need to begin by considering a precursor to the ballets in the Spring Showcase so that you'll be able to appreciate what it was that Petipa was building on in La Bayadere and also what it was that Balanchine was reflecting back upon in Scotch Symphony. So I want to begin with La Sylphide, which was created in 1832 by Filippo Taglioni for his daughter Marie. Now some of you may be sitting there thinking, wait a minute, La Sylphide was created by Bournonville. Uh, and you would be right, but so am I. Uh, Bournonville based his La Sylphide on Taglioni's that he saw on a trip to Paris. And he was so taken by it that he purchased the libretto he tried to purchase the music but couldn't afford it. So took the libretto, went back to Copenhagen, had somebody else write new music for it, and created his own version of La Sylphide. But I want to talk about the original Taglioni's. Now, a Sylphide is a creature of the air, like a fairy of the air. And why do I start with this ballet? Well, although ballet has its deep roots in the Italian Renaissance, and later, was transferred to France where it flourished, most especially under Louis XIV, uh, who put into place the institutions that enabled the form to move from being an amateur, court-based art to a professional theater-based one. Uh, for a long time, ballet didn't look like anything that we associate with ballet. It starts to look like what we think of as ballet with La Sylphide. And one of the most important reasons is point work. Now, point work had existed for a long time up until this point, but it had just been used as kind of an acrobatic trick. And the contemporary accounts refer to the fact that ballerinas used to heave themselves up into point in kind of an ungraceful way, balance there for a moment, and that was that. But Taglioni, through her strength and her artistry, began to use point work as a poetic device. And 
Point work was especially good at depicting these kinds of creatures of the air because she was able to give the illusion that she was lighter than air, that she was an ethereal, otherworldly creature. So that starts with Taglioni, and of course, in this ballet. And once she does it, then everybody has to do it. Her costume, that long, what we call the romantic tutu, also contributed to this sense that she wasn't really a woman, that she floated and flew. Uh, but the other reason it's important to us is because this ballet made Marie Taglioni the first international superstar in ballet. And what happened as a result is that ballerina became supreme, and the men were very quickly sidelined. Up until this point, men dominated in ballet. After this, they will be increasingly sidelined until we get to the point where they were referred to as porteurs, porters. They were just there to help the ballerina pose on point longer than she could by herself, and to lift and carry her around to add to this illusion that she could fly. So this whole vision of the ballerina as this ethereal, lighter than air uh, creature starts with La Sylphide. But it's important to us for another critical reason, and that is that it set the form for romantic ballet, for that style. And in romantic ballet, the story is critically important. These romantic ballets after La Sylphide were all about some melodramatic story. And they all had to have a white act, the Ballet Blanc, oh, an act that was populated by some kind of feminine, otherworldly creature. 